Okay, his microphone just started. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome everybody. I say that and then, oh, here we go. All right. Well, welcome everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming out to the Washington County Heritage Center and welcome to those of you on Zoom as well. If you have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. And those of you in person, you can yell or raise your hand or whatever Sue and Taylor want. <laughs> So a, quick, a couple quick things. Um, my name is Emily Krofjeski. I'm the site manager here at the Heritage Center. We are open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day but Monday. Brent Peterson is back there. Wait, hi, Brent. <laughs> He's our executive director at the VCHS, a big baseball fan as well. Um, a couple other things. Uh, our next event is going to be a closing reception for Art Reach St. Croix, the gallery that is in um, the other hallway right there. And that's going to be on July 10th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. The artists are going to be available to talk about their pieces and you can ask them questions about their processes. That's the last time to check out those pieces before they swap them out for new ones. So be sure to attend that if you like. There are going to be refreshments, just saying. A <laughs> um, few other things. Um, if you don't mind taking a moment to silence your cell phones, that would be very appreciated. Everyone's reaching with their pockets. <laughs> and a few things about uh, Stu before we get started. He gives you a little bit of an intro there. Uh, he is a prolific author, that is putting it mildly, of over 40 nonfiction books for adults and young readers, and I'm sure he's added to that since uh, that really stat awesome. came out. In addition to writing, uh, Thornley does data casting for the Minnesota Twins for the Major League Baseball website. He's also traveled extensively throughout the country to visit the grave markers of every single member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. That is a lot of people. Um, in the back here, we have Taylor Simon, and he is going to, Simons, sorry, he's going to be talking about all of his memorabilia back there, lots of really cool stuff, so very excited to hear more about that. A little about him, a lifelong baseball fan and hobbyist of the game, he started collecting at the age of 10. Uh, growing up in Minnesota, Taylor desired a way to bring himself closer to history and the roots of baseball in Minnesota. So, without further ado, um, welcome Taylor Simons and Steve Bowling. <laughs> First, be brief because I think it's more interesting when we get turned around because Taylor's going to have the memorabilia back there. Emily mentioned I like visiting the grave sites, the Baseball Hall of Famers, and um, it's over 200. There's a few that I haven't got to now that, you know, I mean, gee, you get to all of them and then they just keep dying. <laughs> <laughs> But the other thing that happens is that the dead ones get elected to the Hall of Fame. And last December, I said, hey, I just added two Hall of Fame graves to my list because I've been to these and the guys got inducted from the Hall of Fame. One is Bill Hodges, who's buried in Brooklyn. And you all know the other one, right? Bud Fowler. Bud Fowler. Um, played here at Stillwater in 1884, was the first black player in minor league baseball. And Brent is the expert on that. And Brent, at least we, we got some memorabilia in this book, a picture, nice picture of Bud Fowler and some, some things from back at that time that are in the collection here. I might add, and if you want to get a book afterwards, please take some of the uh, literature there. Uh, I'm a member for 43 years now of the Society of American Baseball Research. And, and Brent and Rich Arpey in the back are Saber members. Um, there's information about getting involved in that, but one of the things that the information is on is we did a big poster and we made a handout of it of Hall of Famers who have played in Minnesota for teams other than the Twins, because we've got our Twins Hall of Famers, Tony Oliva, Jim Cott, adding to that list this year, and of course Killebrew and Carew and all of that. But uh, there's so many who played with the Minneapolis Miller, St. Paul Saints, Stillwater, St. Cloud, uh, and some of the town teams. So we have a whole list of that that you might like to take. And that's how we're getting our, our information about our society out to. Um, Taylor, when did we first meet? Was when the opening of the City of Baseball Museum in about 2015 or 16? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they had a ceremony at CHS Field. And when you get there, if you haven't yet, before the game, be sure and it's, it's an outstanding museum. I was really impressed when we went in. And uh, Dave Kaplan, um, and Dave's not here because he's in New Jersey. But about two years ago, I don't remember what the purpose of our Zoom call was, but we had a Zoom call 
with Taylor, me, Dave, and Greg Kreindler, an author. And as we were discussing things, I kind of had the idea that maybe we could do a book because Taylor's the great collector and we've got other things from the a City of Baseball Museum and do a book of the memorabilia, write up things, show the memorabilia. And Norton Stillman here, I've known Norton since 1987, uh, published this. Norton's the owner of Noden Press. And we've done, I don't know, five to 10 books together. The first one was on the Minneapolis Millers when I went in to see Norton in 1987 uh, with this manuscript and I didn't think I'd ever find a publisher. And, well, the first good news was when I asked him, so pretty familiar with the Minneapolis Millers. And his birthday is what, April 22nd? Right. Damn, I'm getting to that <laughs> And he said, yeah, my birthday is April 22nd. So <laughs> right when the baseball season opens every year, we'd go to a game for my birthday. And I was, this is good. This is good news. And he agreed to publish the book on to Nicola. And that just kind of opened up a lot of things because we did many more books together. And uh, that, for me, it was a big, good thing because it led to more jobs. I mean, different jobs. I, I got into writing full time and things like that. And I'm happy that, dang, it's uh, nearly 35 years later, we're still doing books. Um, one of the things that, that I liked is we were talking on the Zoom call, and Greg Kreindler is an author, or I mean, an artist. And one of his pictures is in the on page 65 of George Hallis. Everybody knows George Hallis. Well, you know that he played baseball. In fact, if they say that he, Babe Ruth took his place in right field for the Yankees. And George Hallis got sent to the St. Paul Saints. So this great football, one of the founders of the National Football League, uh, played baseball here in St. Paul. And Dave, Dave Kaplan was talking about how he read about how George Hallis, when he was cut from the Yankees and told he's being sent down to the minors, he was devastated. But he said that Miller Huggins uh, just was understanding of that, uh, that, that he, uh, he was grateful in which manner in which he was told this. And he remembered that when he became owner of the Chicago Bears, because he had to cut players as the coach, as the owner. And he kept that in mind. And I think it was when Dave was telling that story that I said, you know, there's some really good stories. It's not just, you know, taking uh, taking a piece of memorabilia and writing something around it, but uh, a lot of, of good things. It's such a great history that we've had, especially I'm more familiar with it, with Minneapolis and St. Paul, with the Millers and Saints. The years that they played together in the minor league, they were the two best teams in the league. They had loads of players that went on to the Hall of Fame from Duke Snyder, Roy Campanella, Lefty Gomez, Willie Mays, Carl Yastrzemski, and Taylor's got some of that stuff too. Uh, but because I, Greg uh, didn't want to really get involved as kind of co-authoring this book with, with Taylor and, and Dave and me, but contributed some of his art. And so there's a few kind of right in the middle section on Greg Kreindler, a bio on him. Um, but some of the other artists that we've had locally, um, Dave Frischberg, that name familiar, he just died in the last year. He wrote the song band Lingle Mungo. He wrote songs for uh, Sesame Street and, and, and all of that. And Dave is from St. Paul. And he went to Lexington Park. Um, we, he, Dave and I got to know him a couple of times when he was in town and he signed a sheet copy thing of Van Lingle Mungo. We have that in there. Um, and uh, Charles Schultz. You all know he's from St. Paul. And he um, did a 1974, even did a trivia question involving the St. Paul Saints. <laughs> so they've got that comic strip from there and a little information on, on Charles Schultz. But the, uh, and by the way, you're seeing this book for the first time. Norton just brought them here tonight and opened them up. And Taylor and I are getting our first look at the book as well. Um, so, and I'm, we're very happy with with how it came out. And it's a way to capture a lot of the great information on the, the great baseball heritage that we have in, in Minnesota. We touch on a lot of the things going back to the 1800s, but Fowler and John Donaldson in the early part of the 20th century still hasn't made the Hall of Fame, but 
Um, there's a person here in town who keeps him alive by researching all of the games that John Donald, Donaldson uh, played. And so we've tried to capture that. And it's mostly about a little bit more about the past. It is some twin stuff, but that's why I think Dave Kaplan came up with the uh, title of minor treasures to more highlight that it's mostly minor league stuff. And it might be minor league, but it's, you know, major league in so many ways of its significance and everything else. So that's all I've got to say because all the cool stuff is in back. And I don't know if you want to, you want to kind of operate from the back there, Taylor, and people maybe turn your chairs or sure. I'll just get out of the way here and let you take it over. <laughs> Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do it while you are moving stuff around. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming on the Taylor Science. This is actually pretty fun for me. Uh, most of my life, my uh, my stage has been my parents and my friends. <laughs> With my um, you know, my parents are here today and um, you know, I, 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 since I was a kid at 10 years old, I would start with baseball cards and, and um, started to get into the memorabilia probably around 12 or 13 years old. Um, and actually, my dad was with me on the first time that I ever bought, you know, a couple of baseball bats used by some players. And uh, at 12 years old, eBay is just becoming big. And I'm sure, you know, I tell my dad, hey, I just bought some bats on eBay. He's probably, well, how did you do that? <laughs> And sure enough, I said, hey, you're going to have to drive me to, to meet this, this, this friend of mine, Andy, who's become a really great friend and a mentor uh, uh, for me in, in this hobby. Um, go, to, go to St. Paul, pick these up, and that kind of started it all. And, and you know, growing up, I was always looking for, for memorabilia to collect. And, you know, at that time, here you live with your parents, and you got to find some real estate to store it. And more often than not, it went under their bed. Uh, or my bed, or any place that I could put it, um, and it just the collection just started to continue to grow, and um, up until you know about you know eight to ten years ago, um, I really started to hone in on on these two teams, uh, the Millers and the Saints, and that kind of all started uh, when I went to a baseball game. And baseball, uh, I've had an affinity for it my, my whole life, and you know it could be you know I played it as a, as a kid in high school. Um, or, you know, as an adult, uh, after a long work week or a long work day, I would just go to the game, sometimes by myself, and just kind of immerse myself in the culture and, and the experience. So this is a, a way for me <laughs> to bring myself closer to the game. Um, everything from, you know, the advertising that you see here to the, to the uniforms and the bats um, that the players wore, and even some of the photos, um, everything is so unique and tells a specific story. Um, some of the things that you, you, can't, you can't get by watching a game on television. Uh, now with, with the, you know, the, the videos that they have and the quality, you can really see the details. And um, so this was my way to kind of bring me closer to that. Um, it's not often that, or it is actually pretty often that if I get a bat that's got a bunch of pine tar on it, the first thing that I do is I smell the pine tar. I, I feel the bats and it just, and for me, it's, it's, it's my weird way to, to really immerse myself into it. So um, I guess I'll bring you kind of through a, a little visual walking tour of what I brought to share today. Um, this is a, a small portion of my collection. Um, a few years back, uh, we were able to work with the Saints and, and, and great people like Stu and Frank White and, and um, all the great people that were part of the museum um, to find another avenue to share my collection. So um, I brought in today just kind of a little bit of uh, everything. Um, and really, it kind of just talks a little bit about uh, the influence and, and the two teams that were really important to the, the Twin Cities here and the people that lived here. And I think, um, you know, I learned that, you know, back way in the 20s and 30s, when these teams were playing, it was a big social event. Um, they would have double headers, you know, July 4th, they would start in St. Paul, take the trolley cars, through the street cars over to Minneapolis. Um, and it, it, it really brought the cities together. There was a big rivalry. You know, I've heard stories that even the families would, you know, go after each other at the baseball games and, and whatnot. So 
Uh, back then, they didn't really have the electronics um, that we have today, so a big portion of their way of promoting the games were these broadsides signs. And um, I brought a couple in today. Um, not only were they really, you know, they had to have them pop, so they had to be very visually appealing. Um, I brought one in here from 1958. And, um, this one's kind of uh, important and special to me because I grew up in the North Metro of Blaine. And so this was an event, uh, a game, uh, the Millers versus, I think it was Denver Bears, and the, it was an Anoka night, so being close to Blaine. Um, I thought that was pretty cool to find something like this. Uh, the next one over is uh, one from 1939. Uh, this is more of a, instead of promoting a specific game, this is promoting uh, the specific schedule for the Millers in 1939. And that, of course, was baseball's bicentennial. So they influenced them not only in Major League Baseball and all of Minor League Baseball in their advertising. Uh, they would use this imagery. Um, and it's today probably one of the most sought after um, you know, collecting for, for people that do pre-war baseball. Um, they just really like that time of the year. Um, the next, the uniform that you see there is from the Minneapolis Millers. Um, that dates anywhere between 1900 and 1904. Um, the oldest uniform that I have in my collection. Um, and I try to bring in a series of different periods of uniforms. Um, I know I have a lot in the museum, so what I had available, I tried to show the difference in the quality of the uniforms and the weights of the uniforms. And you'll notice, you know, earlier in the years, um, they, they would wear more of a lighter material with the sun collars. Um, and they were pretty simple. Um, you know, typical gray road or a, a, a white home. Um, and, you know, if you look at some of these other uniforms, specifically that 47 Saints jersey, way to the far right, the thickness of the jerseys are, are have changed over time. And I was talking um, to George earlier today, and we were uh, in the rain, and we were, I said, feel that jersey. It's, it's really thick. And can you imagine, you know, dog days of summer, 95 degrees, playing a whole game and something that thick. And obviously I think it was probably for durable reasons and, and making sure that if they invested in the uniforms that they would last, get a few years out of it. But- um, Question? Yes, sir. For how many years did the uh, Millers play at Metropolitan Stadium? They started there in 1956. And uh, so that was the first season. 1960 was their last season. And then the twins came in 61. So four or five years. Was that stadium built? The idea that the team, uh, yes, and I think, and Stu could probably talk a little bit more about it, but I think they they developed it to a point where they could easily expand the stadium. Um, so if a major league team were to come in, that it was set up that way. Um, and 55 was the last year of Nicollet Park where the Millers played, and I think that was a big push was to try to gain major league attention. Um, next to this Miller's uniform, um, I brought in some old programs. Some of, some of the hardest things to find as a collector are, are stuff that predate 1900. And to be able to find old programs, I mean, probably the easiest thing to get while you're at the ballpark, but probably the easiest thing to, to throw away. And so to be able to find programs, so I have one here from uh, 1877. Um, this is one of the first Minneapolis baseball teams. Um, I think at this point, Stu, were they amateur ball at the uh, semi pro? the transition, Rich is a real expert on like that league alliance. And... They were to technically professionals because they were paid. Yeah. They signed contracts, so they were professionals. <laughs> so this was uh, the Minneapolis Brown stocking. So I think maybe, you know, I, I, I use Stu's research as a lot of my basis on what I collect. And so I think this was the Minneapolis Brown stockings. At some point, they might have been the, the blue stockings in a, a year or two in between that or before or after. Um, but this was probably one of my favorite pieces. I, I, I more gravitate towards, you know, those hard needle in the haystack pieces that are some of my favorites um, or, or pieces that I actually got a, a, an opportunity to speak to the family or the player. And we'll get down to the Carl Yastrzemski jersey there that he wore for Minneapolis and, and, and my experience, you know, 
finding the uniform, meeting him, and, and really learning a lot about memories that he had. And that's what it's kind of, you know, the greatest thing for me is to not only collect great things to share for everybody to enjoy, <laughs> not just myself, um, but it's the stories, it's learning the history, and um, I've, I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, here we have, so that's a Minneapolis program. Here we've got the, sure, so absolutely. they can all, everyone can see. Absolutely. Here we have a, a 1898 program. This is for the St. Paul Saints. Uh, they actually played the Detroit Tigers um, at this point, because um, I believe they were in the Western League at that time. Um, it was probably one of the earlier known programs. I think both of these are probably one of the earliest known Saints or Miller's programs out there. And again, very simple, very simple format to it. Um, not a lot, as you look at programs today, there's a lot of pages, a lot of advertising. And yes, there is a lot of advertising on these, um, but not a lot of pages, simple scorecard um, and a nice piece to take home with you. Um, here we have a, a 1919 players transfer contract from the New York Yankees with the St. Paul Saints. Um, uh, the story around this is, uh, and I hope I quote it right, that at some point, uh, Miller Huggins, who is the uh, New York Yankees manager <laughs> for the longest time, Coach Babe Ruth and Pierre, he became uh, a silent owner, I think, of, of the St. Paul Saints. And um, this predates that, uh, but this might be one of the first relics to kind of really show that relationship between the Saints and the New York Yankees. Now they were never were affiliated. Um, and, you know, it was a common practice where if there was a relationship somewhere that um, they would try to work with the teams and, you know, buy players, sell players, all that kind of stuff. And, and traditionally you have a minor league club that's your feeder system to, you know, the major league groups. Um, and at that point, the Saints weren't affiliated at that point. Uh, my favorite uh, memory of this actually is um, when we were developing the, the City of Baseball Museum, uh, Mike Goldkling, um, who is one of the owners of the Saints, and Dave Kaplan, um, who is our curator of the museum, um, they had gave me a call and let me know that um, there was a family of John Norton, who was the owner of the Saints, I believe from 1914 or 1915 to 1924. And um, uh, he was a real estate guy, wasn't really a baseball enthusiast. Um, and at that point, the Saints were kind of on a downturn. They weren't doing very well. And there was other investors coming into St. Paul looking to buy a team and relocating them. Uh, the owner at the time really didn't want to relocate the Saints. So again, it's a big community. Um, and reached out to a real estate guy of John Norton by saying, hey, look, this could be a good investment for you. He was interested in the land uh, where the ballpark was, ended up buying the team. And then the next 10 years, nine years were some of the greatest baseball that they saw at St. Paul. Um, you know, some of the, the 1920 team, the 1922 team, the 1919 team, the 1924 team, all of these teams had some of the greatest minor league baseball players of that era. Um, so uh, as I went to this family's house and we were working on uh, a transaction to bring these trophies that he had some trophies from 1919 and 1922 that his uh, great grandfather or his great great grandfather had. And their interest was to find uh, a place where they could be appreciated. So it was a perfect fit for us. And um, we ended up, you know, working through a, a transaction that would allow the trophies to be in the museum on display permanently. And I had mentioned to them, I said, hey, uh, have you ever seen your great grandfather, or your great great grandfather's signature before? Because I have a contract with his, his signature on it, and it was a really cool talking piece. It ended up, um, I think Mike and Mike and Dave were there with me for about an hour. I think I stayed for six hours, had dinner with the family, and that again is my favorite part: is learning the history, hearing the stories. Um, and so I just thought that was really cool, and it tied another personal level for this artifact for me. Um, we brought in um, some examples of what season passes looked like back then. Uh, this is from 1927. This was a team that Leo DeRocher was on. Um, so this was something that they would hand out um, to season ticket holders. Uh, they did have obviously game day tickets as well, but this would kind of be like a 
you know, here's my free, my get in free card, basically, my, my season pass. Um, here we have, uh, I brought this autograph booklet in from the St. Paul Saints. This is from 1935. Um, you know, maybe not the best Saints team, but what's important are some of the names that are on this. Um, the first name that kind of sticks out to me is Phil Todd. Um, Phil Todd, you know, had a cup of coffee in the major leagues, maybe a little bit longer, but um, not a famous baseball player by any means. But he's more infamous than anything. Um, the Red Sox, when they had traded or purchased the rights to Babe Ruth, uh, went to the Yankees and, you know, did all his great things with the Yankees. Well, the Red Sox um, obviously were not very happy about that because now they're subsidiary or secondary to the Yankees. And so at some point, the Yankees were going to offer a trade for Lou Gehrig to uh, the Boston Red Sox. And the guy that they wanted from the Red Sox was Phil Todd. So it's just kind of a cool connection and a cool story that um, um, we talk about all the time, but not a lot of people know about. Another name in here is uh, Monty Stratton. Um, I'm not so familiar with Monty Stratton, but I know there's the Stratton story. Um, Monty played for the Saints in 1935. I think he was played for the Saints. There was an accident that happened with him and then came back later. Um, and I think played for the Chicago White Sox and, and uh, um, had a good career after that. So, um, so just kind of a cool, you know, for me to go down memory alley and just kind of see their penmanship much different than you probably look at our penmanship these days, or at least mine, not very nice. Um, uh, and then I brought in some team photos. I tried to focus on some of the greater St. Paul Saints team. So we have here um, two photos. Uh, one is just a little postcard um, and they're of the same team. So the first one will show the larger one. This actually is my greatest Stillwater find. Um, <laughs> uh, every now and then when I come down to Stillwater, I go into all the antique shops. And um, I was walking around one day as I always do, just looking for baseball stuff or anything that's interesting. And when you look at this picture, you probably think it's just a bunch of business guys, you know, no one would really know. For me, I'm always studying every day and I knew exactly what it was right when I saw it, uh, that this was a baseball team. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the year, I, I almost fell over. 1920 is, I maybe I think they were the seventh or greatest, eighth greatest minor league baseball team, I think still to this day. Um, this is an actual original picture of that team um, and these, these pictures were not um, given mass produced. These were only given to uh, players that were on that team or staff members that were on that team or coaches. And so it was in a frame. And I, for me, I try to tie the artifact to the player. Uh, so I called my mom and said, oh my God, you won't believe what I got. Uh, I can't believe I found it. It's probably the greatest, you know, hundred dollars I ever spent. And for me, it's a piece of history. And I said, I can't wait to get home. I'm going to open it up. Um, I couldn't even wait until I got a mile down the road. I had to pull over. Um, I opened up the frame. And on the back here is a public school uh, diploma for uh, a youngster from 1907. And it actually, so the name on it is Reese Williams. Um, his, I guess you could say his player name is Riverboat Williams. He was on the 1920 team, so it proved, I guess, my theory of, you know, the only time that you really get these pictures is if you're part of the team. And man, was I ecstatic! Um, so not only do I have his, uh, you know, how he scored in in algebra and writing, maybe when he was probably eight or nine years old, but I've got an actually great important piece of uh, Minnesota baseball history. And then, so this here um, is a picture of the same team but in their uniforms um, as they were the uh, uh, American Association of Penn and that year. So I tried to show the difference between the two. Um, we'll get into advertising. This one right here, I think is really important. So uh, this one is from 1938, um, the Minneapolis Old Millers. Um, you know, the, the Saints and the Yankees were known for doing barnstorming events with Babe Ruth and, and whatnot. And this was a specific barnstorming event where the Millers um, uh, played a, a local, I think, town ball team, um, Morristown. And so the game, I think, was sometime around, it probably says on here, in September. 
1938 was the year that Ted Williams was with the Millers. Um, and when I got this, again, it was in a frame. Um, that was really cool. Obviously tells a great story about local baseball. Uh, when I opened it up, I turned it around and I noticed that there were five signatures on the back. And on the back, um, there's signatures of Harry Taylor, Fabian Gaffney, Ted Williams, Andy Cohen, and then a gentleman that I have not identified yet is Ernestine Anderson. Um, so I don't know if it was someone part of the team, travel secretary or whatever the case is, but um, it really was really cool to me, um, you know, back then, you know, probably the readily available pen you had was a pencil. Um, and for me, for authenticity purposes, that kind of etched it in the stone. So, um, and then probably some of the favorite things that I collect are, are bats that the players have used. Um, I probably have about a hundred of them, um, all from players from the Millers and the Saints. Um, and so I brought three in today, um, three that I thought were pretty important, um, uh, the first one is uh, Joe Rigger. Uh, Joe Rigger was a pretty good uh, Major League Baseball player, but he played in the 1920s for the St. Saint Paul Saints. Um, I've read articles that he may be one of the greatest minor league baseball players of that era. Um, and was a very important piece for the Saints during all their pennants um, back then. Um, How heavy is that? Uh, I would say this one. So back then they would use heavier lumber, thicker handles. Um, this one I think is probably doesn't live up to it. Uh, I would say it's probably about 36 ounces. Um, I think the largest bat that I own is a 40 or 41 ounce, um, a Hank Gowdy bat. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a difference between today's bats and the bats that they used back then. What do they use today? Um, they use a lot of ash bats, but I think the biggest difference that you see is they try to get them as light as they can get, thinner handles. So you'll notice as you watch a game, they're snapping bats left and right. And I think a part of that too is, you know, the way, you know, the, the, the velocity of the pitches, um, you know, all the different pitches that they throw these days. Um, but, uh, you know, what I like most about these bats or any bat that I have is the characteristic of the bats. Um, and that's why I think I, 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 I have more of an interest in, in and, and, and these is because it brings me closer to that individual player or that individual time. Um, there are some bats that I have, and it's kind of disgusting, but back in the day, um, well, predominantly in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, um, you know, there's a lot of tobacco chewing back then. And what they would do, or the theory was that they would spit on their bats, <coughs> they would take a calf bone and they would start bone rubbing their bats. And for some, it would make the barrel harder. Um, there's other things that they do. They would take knives and they would score the handles. And there's a bat back here that you could see the actual grooves that they would put into the bat for the enhanced gripping. Um, I've seen you know, some bats where they would, you know, now today's you would see the hollow out top. There they would cut the bat open, put in some kind of wood filler to make the barrel harder and the bat lighter. Um, you know, so it, it really, it's, it's, it's cool. Not only can you identify that, you know, certain characteristics, if you have multiple examples of them, um, you can kind of put it together and trace it to the player. Um, for me, you know, if I was a ball player, yeah, I might have my name branded on the bat and I try to pick up my bat every time. Um, but any player could probably use any player's bat. But when you start to get into specific things that they would do to really tie it to them, that's where you can kind of really identify, okay, this player held it, this player used it for however long. And, um, you know, back then, today, players probably get 20 to 50 bats a year, depending on who you are, you might have more than that. Back then, they may have got five to six bats a year. Some players did have contracts with Killer Rich and Bradsby or Louisville Slugger, so they would use other player bats. Um, so they would try to use them as long as they can if they, if they chipped wood on the back, they would take bat boy nails or nails and nail it back together to try to get the full season out. Um, is Hillip and Bransby a competitor? No, I think they were, uh, they're, they're, they're one of the same. Um, I'm not sure when it all changed, um, but they, you know, if you were to look at the branding on the back, you know, it does say Hillary and Bransby, but it also does say Louisville Slugger. So at some point, I think they just changed it. Okay. Slugger. 
monopoly Yeah. Yeah, really back then there was only two or three major bat manufacturers. There was Spalding, there was Louisville Slugger. Um, and then there was a couple other ones um, that aren't really famously known now. But other than that, you would see some people would make homemade bats. Um, there were some other smaller bat companies that were trying to get into you know, the business. But really, um, the, the, the pride and joy was if you could get a Louisville Slugger contract, you know, <laughs> then you could get all your bats produced. Um, and back then, especially if you're in the minor leagues, you may be a young guy, maybe a lot of potential, but you don't have a contract. So they would get a loaner from a, another team, another player on their team. They would use the bat. And if they really liked it and they liked the model, they would send it to the Louisville Slugger factory. And then they would make bats for them with their signature on it. So there are some bats where you will notice uh, it's not on this one, but there'll be some um, grease ink writing on that. And that is a bolt mark. The bat was sent to Louisville Slugger. They'll tell you the date, who sent it, what team, and then um, they keep that in their vault. And then they were all released, I think, sometime in the 80s or 90s. But it's another way where I might have a uh, Joe Rigger bat, but it was sent to Louisville Slugger by Babe Ruth. Well, that means that Babe Ruth used it, sent it in to get that model made for him to use moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that, I think that's the typical <coughs> practice. Um, <coughs> I don't think it does, um, but again, I'm. Yeah, you know, and, and some people, you know, they'll call them you know, lower barrel hitters or top barrel hitters. Um, or there'll be people that, you know, you'll, if you look at the bats, there's bat and ball marks all the way around. It's probably because they're when they line up, they don't look at the bat. They just stand up there and just start swinging. So, you know, every player's got their weird nuances and, and what they do. Um, probably one of my more favorite bats, and a lot of people don't know this guy. Um, Joe Hauser was a staple for the Millers in the 30s. Um, Joe Hauser, uh, hit 69 home runs one year. Uh, I think he also hit 64 home runs one year, 66 home runs one year. Uh, he was the quintessential power hitter of the minor leagues back then. And, you know, he had the favorable Nicollet Park, um, which was not very large. Um, but this is a bat that he used between 1931 and 1933. And 1933 was the year that he hit 69 home runs. Um, you know, and I think we all remember probably McGuire and Sosa you know, in that 98 summer where they were going back and forth, back and forth, and then obviously Barry Bonds came and whatnot. But um, not a lot of people know him. Um, and he was a prolific power hitter back in the day. And he played here in Minneapolis. Um, and much like any other minor league artifact, they're hard to find. You know, they would use them until they're done, throw them away. So to find a piece like this, um, to attribute it to probably the season and when he was you know, walloping in balls over the fence at an enormous rate is pretty cool to have. Um, and I actually have the, the scorecard from that game that he hit his 68 and 69 home run, which I found later. So it's just kind of a cool presentation where here's the actual game. And what I like about scorecards is you can see, you know, all the details about the game. You know, I've got the luxury of Stu's book, Stu's research um, that I'm looking at every day and all the game stats, the individual stats. Um, so it's easy for me, but it's cool to kind of get something like this. And if I want to know that it's real, I go to Stu's data. All the time. And that kind of is the sure thing for me. And every time it's matched up. So it's, it's wonderful. And then the next um, bat I brought in is a, a local guy, Spencer Harris. Um, Spencer Harris was a longtime Minneapolis Miller, played in the PCL for a long time. Uh, what people don't know about Spencer Harris, not only is he a local guy, played for the White Sox. Like, and maybe I think the Philadelphia Athletics for a little bit, but a career minor leaguer, played over 20 seasons. He still is the active all-time hits leader in minor league baseball with like almost 4,000 hits, I think. Um, uh, and I think he's the career, still the career leader in career doubles, career stacking triples. Um, and this was a guy that was a prominent figure, you know, for the Minneapolis Millers in the 30s. Um, and he's a Minnesotan. And what I like about this bat is when I was talking about characteristics, um, you can see, and I have a couple of his examples, but he always prepared his bats the same way. 
He would always use a lot of pine tar. He would always take a knife and score his handle for enhanced grip. Um, and uh, he's the player that I was mentioning that would cut the top off, fill it with certain, I don't know what you would call it, wood putty or something like that to, to enhance the sturdiness of the back. So I'm assuming he thought, you know, it would give him a better spin on the ball um, or make better contact. So um, I, I, I really pride myself on trying to find local people um, because I, I, I think we all know the Twins and you know, all the great people that played for the Twins. And we all know the great major leaguers that played for the Saints and Millers, but we don't really know some of the obscure people that um, are local legends and probably were a local legend back then. Uh, here's just kind of the uh, compilation of uh, the 1932 Millers team. Um, this was one of the, the, the greater Millers team. They went to the Junior World Series, uh, played New York, New York Eagles. Um, so I brought in a program from the Junior World Series, um, some different ticket stubs. Here, I'll show you guys that, sorry. Yeah, they're good. Um, and then some different ticket stubs. You know, back then, you know, they, they used a lot of big tickets. Now, you, it's rare to get a ticket to any event. These days, it's all electronic. Um, but it's kind of cool and fascinating to see, you know, how they would produce tickets. And the only time you really get a ticket like this, I guess, is at an all-star game or a World Series or something like that. Um, but these two are from New York when they played in game one and game two. Um, and then we've got a game five here ticket from Nicollet Park. Uh, and then we actually have a signed baseball from the 32 team um, with some great people, Joe Hauser again, Spencer Harris, um, which team signed baseballs um, are, are difficult to find when you get into like the 1940s and earlier. Anything pre-war is tough. Is tough. Um, especially during the World War II, or II era. I mean, finding programs or anything, I mean, they just, they didn't have it, um, you know, probably because of the times and spending that money on that. So, um, and then we have a press pin here. I actually brought in for students. I thought Steve might like it. Um, but it's a 1932 uh, Nicollet Park press pin for the Junior World Series as well. So um, now we'll kind of get into the fun stuff. Um, <laughs> The ticket booth sign, uh, this is a little bit later. So this is, um, it is from Metropolitan Stadium. Um, you know, I, I would probably more contribute this to the 70s, but there was a tie to the Met Stadium where the Millers did play for a few years before the Twins came in. Um, and I thought it was a cool backdrop, right? Mm -hmm. Take away some of the white wall. Um, <laughs> and then we'll kind of get into the uniform too. So this is an example of a Miller's jersey um, from the 1950s. Um, this would be the style that Willie Mays wore, Monty Irvin wore. Um, this one is from 1953, could have been used later on. Again, they would use uniforms until they basically fell apart. Um, or for like the Millers, um, they would get a lot of hand-me-downs from the New York Giants. Um, so it's not uncommon where if I find one, if you hold it up to the light, you can see the writing New York or uh, Giants underneath it. And then there are certain identifiers where you can kind of tell was it worn in the big leagues and then sent down later? Um, in the book, um, we talked about a St. Cloud Rocks jersey that I had. And that was a jersey that was worn in the 51 World Series um, between the New York Giants and the uh, New York Yankees. And that was the famous 51 year of the shot heard around the world uh, with Bobby Thompson. And so I, I had acquired this jersey. It said St. Cloud. I was ecstatic because it's a St. Cloud Rocks jersey right from the 50s it's local when i got it i knew it was something different and it had the player's id name tag in the back which was a common practice back then um and it wasn't anyone that played on that team um, for the st cloud rock so i found out that his name was george spencer he was a rookie for the giants in 51 um and what i like to do is i'll try to research where they live do they have a telephone number more so to say hey I I got maybe a family heirloom here that you might want. Um, and uh, ended up going and, and, and reaching out to them, had a lot of wonderful conversations, um, ended up sending the jersey to him. They signed it for me. But what I enjoyed most of it was the eight to 10 phone calls that we had, me being able to ask him questions about his memories. And I did ask him, I go, what was your favorite memory? And he goes, well, in 51, I was 18 years old. I had no 
reason to be pitching in a World Series at all. And he goes, I faced three batters, Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle, and Joe DiMaggio. And I got oh, all out. That was my most famous moment that I you know, personally had that I will always remember. So we, we spent a lot of time, hours at a time. Um, and it was more me asking him questions and listening. Um, but I got to learn a lot of stories and, uh, and to a point where maybe we got on such good terms where he's like, come fly out and meet me in Ohio. Let's have some beers and we'll, we'll talk more baseball. Um, so um, I brought this in because I thought it was a, a, a cool kind of a showpiece to kind of show the 55 Millers. And that was the team they won the Junior World Series. Um, and actually their first Junior World Series that they won. And ironically, the last year at Nicollet Park. Um, so this would be an example of the uniform that they wore the same color type. They were affiliated with the New York Giants. Um, I brought in a team sign baseball of that team that has Monty Irving on that. Um, and then this here is the last scored program and last ticket of Nicollet Park. Um, and again, I brought this piece of for Stu. Uh, I know Stu has done a lot of pieces with Nicolette and uh, has the actual, is it the announcers? Uh, it might have been the official score. Tom Breyer, I got his scorebook from that whole season. So I just thought it was really cool, an important piece, you know, especially for us not to that like minor league baseball. Uh, but that was pretty cool. And then we brought in the, uh, uh, the American Association Championship ring. So much different than what people win and get now. It's small, made locally by Justin's. Um, uh, but it's a kind of a cool piece. And that was the reward, was that. And, and uh, hopefully a trip to the major leagues that we did really well. So. Going back to uh, baseball itself, uh, Nowadays, I guess, what you did was before a game, taking control of you know, home runs, basically. Really? Yeah. Did they have heavy balls back then? Um, that might be a better question for Stu. Um, I think the difference is probably now is that, you know, in Major League Baseball now, they'll maybe use a ball for a couple swings. If the ball gets hit a certain way, they're done. And you can always see them, you know, throwing them and exchanging them. I mean, I would, one would believe that back then they probably didn't have the availability of 100 to 200 balls or however many balls they use in a Major League Baseball game today. So if it was rainy, if it was not good weather, they probably got waterlogged. That probably had an impact on the game. Um, you know, I don't, maybe they didn't prep the balls the same way they do. And all you hear today is the pitchers are upset by the baseball. They're changing them all the time. They're too bright. They're too dirty. They feel different. <laughs> You know, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, one would believe that they're probably a little heavier. They thought balls were thrown back on the field. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I think they, they collected them, they gave a free admission, they probably got them back down to the field to, to use again. Yeah. So they, they had fewer balls. And they, they, but, you know, it could be we, just in my lifetime, you know, sometimes they're, they're wound tighter. There's a lively ball. A few years ago, the stitches were flatter, which increases the aerodynamics when it's hit, but it also makes it harder for the pitcher to get that much spin on it. And it sounds like they've been more intentionally doing things with the balls in the past few years to try to deaden them a little bit. <coughs> and it seems to have that effect this year. Um, and then I brought in a, uh, an example of a, uh, a St. Saint Paul Saints uniform um, that they would have wore um, the same type of style that when Roy Campanella was here uh, playing in St. Paul, um, Duke Snyder. Um, this would be the road uniform. Um, now it's changed a little bit over time between the 40s and the 50s. And they wore this style, I think, 47 all the way to 1960. Um, this is more of a late 1950s uh, uniform. Um, but again, pretty simple. Um, and I like the simple, just the simple St. Paul on there, not a lot of color, not a lot of flair. Um, and kind of brought in an example of, you know, some of the other things, their hats. Again, some of the cool things about the hats, and I think here, this Miller's hat. Um, again, it's the personal touch here. They would wear these things for years. And so they're probably more beat up than you would notice. They're a lot smaller than you probably would get today. Um, but on the inside, 
you know, clearly this one, a fan maybe got a hold of or a player threw it up to the fan and then was able to get some signatures from some of the 58 team members. Um, but for me, of course, I'm curious and um, I start opening it up. What can I find? Maybe the dollar <laughs> bill or something. Um, so I found, you know, the player clearly wrote, and I still don't know who this player is, but there's a nickname in here called Whitey Sapita. So maybe probably an homage to, or, or is it Orlando Sapita? Um, I'm not sure who it is yet, so I'm still on my research train of who that nickname may have been. Um, but there was some other writing on here, like uh, Frozen Rabbit Tracks. I'm not sure what that means, but to somebody that meant something. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I really geek out about. And, uh, the artifact is cool in itself, but uh, uh, this would be an example of a, uh, a Miller's uniform uh, from the 1958 and 1960 era. This is when they were now affiliated with the Boston Red Sox. So um, this kind of set right here uh, would have been the, the uniforms that they wore in the very last game that the two teams had <coughs> before they dissolved in the Twins game. Um, and so I wanted to kind of bring that memory back. And uh, what I brought also in here was the, the program from the last game that they ever played, scored, um, and then the ticket stub from that game as well. And actually when I bought this, um, you know, I didn't know, I saw the date, September 8th, second game. Okay, it's probably in the season, in the last season that the two were ever Know, involved. Um, so I reached out, um, and I think I may have actually asked to do this, but I, I wanted, I, I read something that um, the pitcher for the Saints that won that game was a 20 game winner. That last game was his 20th win of the season. And I think when I emailed you, Stu, I said, is that an American League record or is that something that still stands? And I think he might have been the last 20 game winner of the American <coughs> Association at that time. Of uh, and that would be Jim Golden. So Jim Golden was still alive when I got this. So I wrote him a nice letter and I said, hey, you know, I would love to see if we can etch in, etch in stone your accomplishment. And, um, he was able to send me this newspaper article um, back after he signed it for me. And it kind of explains, this was the article um, that I believe the Minneapolis Tribune put out about the, uh, his, his 20th win and then talks about the Saints and Millers to buy it for the Twins coming in. So uh, just another piece to kind of bring it all together. Um, speaking of advertising, <laughs> uh, this is a piece from the 1940s. Now, St. Paul Saints is recognizable. Everything else on this is incorrect. Um, <laughs> and I guess sometimes that happened. This was probably something they never wanted to come out, uh, but somehow somebody got it. So you'll see the St. Paul Saints, great picture of a catcher on there. You'll see Lexington, Kentucky. Probably meant to say Lexington Park. Um, and then Stu actually point this out. He goes, well, the schedule's wrong, too. It says Rochester. They're in the, they're in the International League, right? That's not even part of the American Association. So it was totally wrong. But a great eye appeal piece. It probably has its own story. Um, and uh, uh, just another way, this would have probably been in convenience stores, you know, back in the 30s. A little stand up there. They probably would have had some handouts or maybe some coupons or whatever to to sign up for season tickets or anything like that. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. <laughs> and then this kind of leads us to my, my probably my favorite piece, and I'll actually pick this up. So um, how many of you know who Carl Ostrowski is? Okay, lots of people. Um, so uh, there was, again, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, um, there was a gentleman before me that would collect kind of the, the minor league stuff. And so he, he back in the 70s and the 80s, you know, he was going to trade shows. He was, you know, networking locally. Um, and, you know, I've had the luxury of the internet, uh, the luxury of auction houses. Um, so when I found this piece, or when it got brought to me, I should say, um, I was ecstatic. And the first thing I thought, wow, I found something that this really big collector never found. And so this is Carl Yastrzemski's uniform that he wore in 1960 uh, with the Minneapolis Miller before he went up to the Boston Red Sox. Um, at first when I got it, um, I knew it was the same period, the same style he wore, the same number that he wore with Minneapolis, number seven. And, uh, uh, you know, Stu and I were kind of talking about it earlier today. 
um, uh, a guy by the name of Bob Evans found Willie Mays' Miller's uniform. And at the time they got it, or he got it, he didn't know it was Willie Mays' uniform and went through this extensive research project where he found a, a, an old uh, newspaper um, photograph, which they're really high resolution and was able to find a repair on the sleeve and matched it up to this picture, which then identified it as <laughs> Willie Mays' uniform. So I kind of went down that same path with this one where probably his, um, again, there was a player on the team that wore number seven and 59, wasn't on in 1960, I found a photo and I was able to kind of find the same imperfections. There's some imperfections on this M and it's clear as day, um, you know, kind of how these are shaped up here. There's some divots in there. You can see it perfectly in that picture. So not only can I tie it to him, I can tie it to a specific season. Um, and is probably the earliest known Mistrebsky professional jersey. So again, what I would like to do is reach out to the player and see what I can talk about. Uh, so I reached out to his agent and wasn't expecting to get a response back. I'm just a player. And I got a call back and uh, he said, yeah, you want to fly out to Boston and meet with Carl? And I go, absolutely, I'd love to do that. Uh, so uh, a couple of weeks later, I booked my ticket to Boston stayed in a hotel. Um, he was fortunately having an autograph signing public for people in Boston. Um, so when I got there, it's kind of like, first it was a whole interrogation for 30 to 45 minutes. He wanted to know how I got it, why I have it, what I'm going to do with it. Um, because I think some players, you know, back then they didn't make the money that they make now. And, you know, they used the memorabilia business to, to make a living. And some people will come and and, and get things signed and, and, and sell it. And some players don't care. Some players really didn't care about that. Um, so I got interrogated for about 30 minutes. I had to bring like a portfolio and say, here's, here's what I have. Here's my thoughts on what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll you know, work with the historical society and the museum came about, but I'm just a collector. So he stopped the line and I got an hour dedicated with Carl Yastrzemski by myself. And we talked about the uniform. He wanted to put it on. He's like, I don't know if that's going to be. <laughs> um, and you know what I like to do is I like to to get their autograph and then any notation of when they wore it and for me that kind of seals it if that's that's when he wore it his brother was there his brother was cracking jokes of, you know, there's no way he would have fit in that jersey but then it started to get into me asking him questions about memories and what do you remember about your time in Minneapolis he was brought up in 59 just for the playoffs and he started telling me stories about that year they played Havana Cuba in the Junior World Series and then when they made it to the Junior World Series they played at Met Stadium but it was too cold for the Cubans so I think they played one or two games two games here in Bloomington but it was too cold and you'll, you'll find press photos of the, the Cubans huddling around in the dugout in a big dumpster fire trying to stay warm, right? So they relocated the rest of the games to Cuba. And Carl remembered some of his memories. Um, he, he remembered, he was 18 or 19 at the time. We would get down there, you get off the bus, you would hear gunshots. Mind you, that was when the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on. So a lot of fear happening back then. No? 62. Oh, 62. 62. Oh, okay. Revolution going on there. I'm sorry. That was a revolution. revolution. Yeah. Thanks for correcting. Um, <laughs> But anyhow, tension, right? Tension? Is that fair to say? There you go. Okay. okay. Um, but he remember they got off the bus, a uh, bunch of military were there. Um, you could hear gunshots in the background. Um, within the first 30 minutes, the whole team had to go meet Fidel Castro. And um, he thought it was more of a power play uh, on their part of it. Um, and so it was just quite the experience. They would play the games and it just, you know, can you imagine playing a game and you have military with their guys all around the ballpark and whatnot? So uh, they ended up, I think, losing the World Series that year um, in 59. They won it the year before in 58. Um, but yeah, the, just the process of, you know, getting the opportunity to own this and then going through the process of being able to identify that he wore it and then having that experience with Carl and, and uh, learning about it. And, this was a staple in the museum for the last couple of years. Um, and we switched it out this year. I put in Monty Irving's uh, New York 
part of the yard. Minneapolis Miller's uniform that he wore. Um, so uh, if you ever get an opportunity, we're always trying to bring in new artifacts and keep it fresh to the museum. But this is probably one of my favorites. And then some of the, just the last pieces here, um, I bought in a, a just a wire photo of Dan Bankhead. Um, one of the, I think he was the first African American or black pitcher in base, major league baseball, right? Mm -hmm. Played here in St. Paul. Uh, Roy Campanella is another famous name, played in St. Paul. Um, and then I brought uh, you know, a program from 1924. This was the team that went to the Junior World Series, great baseball team. Um, and uh, this one you can see, uh, some of these are just, uh, have somehow survived the test of time. This one's really falling apart. Um, but if you can find something like this, uh, you have to find, you have to get it because there's only one out there. So I brought that in just to kind of uh, highlight that season. Um, this is a base, team time baseball from 1948, the same year that Roy Campanella uh, played for the team. Unfortunately, it doesn't have Campanella's signature on it. This was from after they played in the Junior World Series versus Montreal. Um, so it is absent of his signature. I think he only played with us. 30 some odd games through May. May 30th? May to June. May to June. Okay. Um, so just another, I mean, it's, it's you know, to read some of the names on here, you know, Dan Bankhead. Um, obviously, you've got the famous manager at that time, uh, Alston, uh, who was the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, manager, mm -hmm. LA Dodgers at the time. Um, so just another great artifact here. Here's a picture of Alston. Um, I think in the playoffs of the 1948 versus uh, Indianapolis Indians. Um, this was in October of 1948. Um, and then I brought in a sample of kind of, again, what the Saints wore. This was from 1947. This was the same year that Duke Snyder uh, played for the Saints. Um, and unfortunately, it was one number shy. This is number 22. You were number 23. Um, but just a great example of how thick the uniforms that they wore back then. It just kind of blows your mind. And then uh, kind of a team picture from 1922 on a great St. Paul Saints team. This is an original panoramic photo. You don't find a lot of these from locally. You'll find them in the big league teams, but locally to kind of have kind of the backdrop of Lexington Park and seeing some of the advertising back then. Uh, just a really cool image. So. Questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. I got one more. The Saints played. Lexington Field, right? That's on Lexington right. Avenue, just south of University Avenue, which is pretty much the heart of uh, the Rondo neighborhood, yep. which was wiped out by Amelia Court. So, were there a lot of black fans that came to both the Saints and, and Miller? You mentioned a lot of black players. Right? Yeah. Um, Stu, you want to answer that? I don't know. There <laughs> <laughs> um, was there were incidents. Uh, 1912. Well, there was a lot of incidents when the Millers and Saints played, but in 1912, there was a black fan who was good at agitating opposing teams. And apparently, some of the Saints fans, when the Millers came to Lexington Park and knew this guy could get under their skin, would buy him a good box seat. <laughs> <laughs> William Crawdad, his name was a joke, could kill him. The Minneapolis manager went into the stands with a bat after this guy. And, um, it wasn't the only time that Gene Mock, years later, went into the stands. They, they, by that time, they were at Midway Stadium. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Rondo would have been um, the south where the, the freeway is now. And uh, Frank White knows better because he grew up in the Rondo neighborhood. It's, as far as that actual Rondo neighborhood itself, how far west that came. Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I've answered the ballpark for walking distance to the Rondo Sports. I bet there were a lot of black fans. Yes, sir. Did Joe Hauser have any kind of a major league career? Very, very brief stint. Um, I know he played for the Philadelphia Athletics. Um, maybe a few seasons. Well, he was um, he was second in home runs to Babe Ruth in 1924, but I think 25. And then he hurt his knee, and he had a lot of knee problems. But um, 
Yeah, he was a good slugger, but after that, just pretty much the rest of his career was uh, minor leagues. And you mentioned he had 60 home runs twice um, with Baltimore, the International League in 1930, he had 63 home runs. And then a few years later, he had 69 with the Millers. So he was the first player to hit 60 in a season. But he did, he was from Milwaukee. Um, and then played, you know, because Milwaukee was in that league. And that's where he got his nickname, Unser Cho, which he said was German for our Joe. Big German community there in, in Milwaukee. But he made it to the majors. And then I, th I think it was after his big, big year in 24, he got hurt. And he spent very little time in the majors after that. But played a number of years in the minors. Uh, he managed up in Duluth. And then Sheboygan, and that's where he lived. I don't know how many, right up to the end, he had a sports shop in, um, in Sheboygan, a little, little north of Milwaukee. Sir. At uh, CHS Field in the, the Saints Museum, there's a collage of the 1877 St. Paul Redcaps. What's the story behind the recorder and that? Yeah. Is uh it's not as great as some of these other ones um it did pop up in a local auction um and at that point i mean i i didn't even know that deep of the roots in baseball and um what i do know is that there was a local uh the comic and sports card store that i would always go to as a kid called shinders and so the owner of shinders had owned that that that, that collage for a long time. And at some point, I think what I was told was that it came into Schindler's from a family member of somebody on that team. And there was a hat and a bat that came along with it. Um, I think over the years, um, you know, there's some moisture damage that, you know, collectively has probably happened over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I heard that it, this, this gentleman may have either had a boat service or a boat on Minnetonka. It was probably displayed on his boat. Um, and <laughs> somehow then finally came in and, and I, once I saw it, I had to have it. And I learned a lot from it. Um, you know, there was, and I don't know who it was uh, with SAPR, um, that reached out to me once they heard that I had it and was doing a research project on finding an image of every Major League Baseball player for their database. Mm -hmm. And this collage um, was able to re-identify two or three people that were on, you know, that were misidentified in their database, you know, and so there was a wonderful article about it, and the forensics of it, and, um, I just thought that was really cool. And not only is that pretty awesome, but the, you know, being an actual true, you know, original photos of one of probably the first professional baseball teams um, uh, is just uh, amazing it's probably, itself. That it's, it's probably fun. one of a kind. Yes. It's probably not a second one. Maybe. No. <laughs> you know, and I didn't, you know, and even when I saw that, I'm like, well, okay, why, why did they make it like this? Because what it is, it's, I think there's eight or nine individual player pictures um, on really, really thin paper. And it's set up in a collage um, where it would have its T name and then whoever the photographer was would put it in this presentation. And what I learned was that's what they would do then to take pictures of it to then mass produce postcard sizes so that everyone could have a piece of it. So, and uh, so I, it's, I mean, it's, a staple in that museum if you ever walk through it's right when you walk in and it's just really cool to see. What are like for each of you something that you know is out there and you just haven't found it? What is that item for you? <laughs> Wish list item. <laughs> um, well one that I don't know is out there that I would love to find would be uh, like Roy Campanella's Saints jersey. I mean that that in itself would be a whole corner of the museum. Uh, just a lot of wonderful history with that person and what he did. Um, you know, there's there's one item that is out there that I would like to relocate, which is Willie Mays' uniform. Um, so, you know, we've got feelers out there trying to find it because that would be 
you know, the one piece that I would love is just put in the museum for as long as that thing is standing. Um, you know, and, and I was talking to somebody else the other day, and the other, you got pretty much everything. I don't know, not really. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of great stuff, but, um, you know, there are players like Ted Williams. I'd love to get a bat that he used with the Millers. And there's one out there, I've seen it. Um, but at the time, was it being acquired? Um, I just heard the other week that, you know, and I don't know if it's true or false that someone actually has Ted Williams uniform from 38 uh, locally. Um, and of course, well, is it for sale? You know, is it a way <laughs> that maybe they want to lend it, you know, to the museum, whatever the case is. And, you know, no, it's never going to see the day of light kind of thing. But there, I think there's some hidden gems out there. And, you know, I try to network as much as I can locally. Um, you know, part of being a hobbyist, there's, there's a lot of individuals that do the same thing that I do, but maybe have different focus points, different things that they collect. Um, you know, some of my greatest friends are twins collectors. And, you know, I was a twins collector and still am, but um, these guys have I mean, famous things. And when you start to create these relationships, you start to look out for one another. And if they hear of something or if they find something and it's something that's in my realm, I'm the first person they call. Uh, so there's a lot of avenues that we can you know, outreach and try to find some of those things. But I might look for a lifetime, you know, to find to find that piece. And it may just come up that, you know, that museum might be a good springboard, you know, to be able to unearth some of these 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 relics that, you know, to somebody probably doesn't mean anything. Maybe they don't even know what it is. And some of those things have come up with the museum. And I think that's a, a great thing for for you know everybody because you know it's it's that's where we want it to be. Sid Hartman has memorabilia also from those years, signed baseballs by Ted Williams. Do you know what the status is on on uh, his stuff? Sid had a couple of rummage sales and yep. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Either that stuff wasn't he wasn't gonna part with it. I think you really just didn't have that much. I mean, he had some bobbleheads and some books, but we have as kitschy. You can buy a pair of his shoes or a sport coat with the suit oh, yeah. on it. You well, have was... any of that? You want to <laughs> probably a sport coat. Oh, uh, uh, I don't know what Sid really had. <laughs> well, I heard him say he had an autographed baseball by Ted Williams. Yeah. Claimed they were, you know, good friends. Good yeah, friends. you know, I've actually been on the look for some of his stuff, and I've seen some of it come out. Um, I think he had a friendship with a, a, a local dealer. Um, so I've seen some like his Minneapolis Lakers things come out, um, but nothing really from the baseball side of it. Hmm. Yeah. But, when, 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 uh, how was it when he was sitting all those home runs? What was his salary? Oh, salary? I don't know, a few thousand a year. Yeah. I always have trouble with that, either with ticket prices or salaries, because, you know, you got to account for inflation. But, um, you know, that was the thing about the minor leagues back then. Joe Hauser wasn't a prospect. He wouldn't be on the St. Saint Paul Saints now, because this is the up-and-comers, the young kids who might make the major league team. But it shows how different minor league baseball was. It was a career for Spencer Harris. And, you know, these guys would play in the minors and they'd work their way up. They'd get to the majors, get some bigger money, and then they couldn't play at that, that level anymore. Well, they didn't have any other skills. They just went down that ladder and made, made money. I think so many of those players, except the big stars, were working second jobs yeah. in the winter. Um, but, you know, even in the 40s, I've heard the, the, the town ball, we've got a little bit about town ball in here. And, uh, you know, there's still a great rich history. You get out and go to games around the state, these great little ballparks. But after the war, the Southern Mini League, Rochester and Owatonna and Faribault, um, you know, they were paying players to come in, especially pitchers. And I hear, I've talked to some of those players who said they went and played down in Rochester because they made more money than playing for the Millers. And I even found some documentation one time of Plymouth Halsey Hall had in this column that pitcher left the Millers to go play in the town ball because he was getting more money. So not not a lot, but that was 
Um, you know, it was, it was before free agency. The players had no choices on teams. And uh, I don't know, today's minor leaguers, it's been the last few years they've pointed out how pitiful their salaries are. You know, you make the majors and it's $600,000 minimum. Um, but back then, they were probably all a lot closer together. It's just not much money for anybody. Working in Manila, after he retired at a liquor store. Yeah. Yeah, but he had a liquor store in Harlem. I think he lived in Long Island, Queens, and he was there late and coming back in his car and hit some ice and was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of them had second businesses. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. question about the yeah, old we'll that we spoke all this stuff, but I'm just wondering you know, why in the 1930s was uh, William Whipple even survived? Like, who has the foresight <laughs> to get a hold of him? But you know the chain of custody of yeah. <laughs> least, uh, Is it like early collectors or just, you know? I mean, you make a good point, you know, especially minor league, you know, memorabilia. It, I mean, you're talking about players, you know, you'd be lucky to see, you know, we had a lot of luck. We had, we had Yastrzemski, Williams, all these wonderful people, but that history is not as rich with a lot of these minor league teams, you know, and we, we, we had these teams for you know, 60, 70 years. Um, you know, so, you know, like, for example, the, the Carl Yastrzemski jersey, the reason that survived is because the bat boy um, that kept that, you know, people knew Yastrzemski was going to be something big. And so at the end of the 1960 season, um, they said to him, take whatever uniform you want. He wasn't a collector. It was more of a memento of his time as a kid. And when the family approached me, they said, you know, it, it sat in the closet. Um, he's, he had some other things. He had a, he had a career with the North Stars. He, he was instrumental in um, with the, I think the Gun Brothers and, and bringing in the San Jose Sharks, you know, you know, building that arena out in California. And um, the, the, the family member that came to me said, yeah, we knew he had this, but, you know, he didn't really keep it for you know, monetary value. It's just more of a family. And so I am a dreamer and I daydream all the time about things that I hope are still out there. And more often or not, you know, you find these things and it, you know, people really don't know what they have. So it's, it's education for them. It's, you know, making sure that they get a fair value for it. But, you know, there, that actually that Saints jersey right there, um, there was a lady that reached out to me. I think I posted maybe one Craigslist ad in my life for something like this. And she had reached out to me. And her husband tried out, he's local, but he tried out for like the St. Louis Cardinals. And at some point, Roger Hornsby gave him a uniform. And I don't, we don't know if it was his for his playing days or a practice jersey. Um, their daughter later on went to Bethel College and was wearing a, the Hornsby jersey around and somehow someone went to her dorm and took it and left that behind. Um, so, you know, <laughs> for me, it's, you know, Hornsby would be great, but to me, that's a great piece. There's, there's not a lot of that stuff. And when I look at all the things that I have, I think the easiest things to find are are probably the, the bats because you know a lot of these players, um, even though there's not very many of them, a lot of these players played at the big leagues. And at some sense, you know, somebody wanted to keep some relic or the Louisville Slugger factory kept a whole bunch of these for 100, 100 years. The uniforms, you know, they would toss them away. The hats, they would toss them away. Um, so I guess to answer your question, yeah, it might not be around. Um, one can only hope and dream, like I do, <laughs> um, because it would be a great, you know, uh, thing for the, the the museum and for everybody to see that that relic. And I, they, the, the the player that wore it is one thing, and, and what they mean to baseball and what they mean to, you know, Minnesota and Minnesota sports. But to be able to look for me, like I look at a relic or an artifact, and it tells a whole different story. And uh, so, yeah, I I have this wish list, and that's on it, but. Likelihood, 99.9%. .9%. It's not wrong. Okay. Uh, books are available up front here. You can see Norton for those. And thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you.
No, it never did. Um, you know, and there's something I mean, I was. Oh, good. Well, thank you. One of my jobs. Just the history of the great I feel the same way. Well, I'm so glad. <laughs> thank you so much. I just want to. Get a little bit of footage. So. Yes, guys. Thank you so much for coming, Linda. Good to see you. Yes, I got Well, I got it. I'll pick it up, but I got it. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? Is that heavy? <laughs> yeah. Regular